This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. When you sign up at the link in the description, you also get access to Nebula, a streaming video service that City Beautiful is a part of. Metropolitan regions are one of the most natural ways of thinking of cities. City boundaries can seem kind of arbitrary, but regions seem to have more of a natural separation between the urban and rural. Someone might say they are from Chicago when they're really from Oak Park. They might feel that way because they work in Chicago or cheer for its sports teams. But the region is part of their identity. Regions are also major economic engines. 80% of Americans live in metropolitan regions, and regions account for an even larger share of the nation's economy. Regions are also front and center in the global economy. Paris, Rio, Tokyo, New York, these are all regions with as much identity and economic power as places like Switzerland or Bolivia. Regions in their primary cities have a global significance. In the United States, despite the natural scale of regions, regional planning and governance is not done in any consistent way. A region may cooperate on transportation, but not municipal utilities, and the next region over may do the exact opposite. In this video, we'll discuss all of the ways cities and regions work together and find out the regions doing the most to create a true regional government. Let's start with the basics. What exactly is a metropolitan area? There's no one scientific, universally accepted definition for where an urban area ends and where the hinterland begins, nor how populous an urban area needs to be before it's considered a metropolitan area. We're focusing on U.S. regions in this video, and in the U.S. they're called Metropolitan Statistical Areas. According to the U.S. Census, an MSA consists of a core area containing a substantial population nucleus, together with adjacent communities having a high degree of economic and social integration with that core. MSAs are assembled out of counties, which can lead to some weirdness. For example, the Eugene Springfield, Oregon MSA is made up of one county, but the county is only a little smaller than the entire state of Connecticut. Much of the county has nothing to do with Eugene or Springfield. But that's the method used in the US, which is why the boundaries kind of look chunky on this map. Okay, with a definition of a metropolitan area firmly in hand, let's talk about why it might make sense for cities within a region to work together. The reasons include transportation, large numbers of people cross municipal boundaries to work, shop, or do lots of other activities. You generally want the streets from one city to line up with the streets from another, and bus routes to cross boundaries. Water supply. Water utilities may be designed to topography, not municipal boundaries, and sometimes multi-jurisdictional control of facilities just makes sense. Air quality. Obviously, air pollution doesn't follow man-made boundaries, so it makes sense to work together to ensure everyone can breathe. Parks. Municipalities have their own local parks, but most urban areas have regional parks and amenities that are used by everyone in the area. Economic development. It's less efficient to have cities within the same region competing against each other to attract employers. Regions that work together can avoid a zero-sum approach to recruiting employers and can help promote the region and the global economy. And housing. Housing markets operate at a regional scale, with some variation city to city. Now that's a pretty good list, but at this point you might be wondering if there are any drawbacks to regional cooperation. Well, here in the United States, regional cooperation isn't really a popular concept, and a lot of that stems from the preference for local control. People like to have a more direct say in things, especially land use planning. It's no coincidence that there are no regional organizations in the United States that control zoning. There are plenty of people who prefer less government rather than more and don't like the idea of adding another layer of governing between the local and state levels. Most regional organizations are run by unelected appointees, which can make them seem opaque and unresponsive to the public. Because of the wide spectrum of views on regional governance, regions take different approaches to cooperation and sometimes use several approaches simultaneously. Let's talk about a few of these approaches. Let's start with the most common way cities in a region work together, through special districts. These districts typically focus on one thing, and many of them cross borders and serve multiple cities. Parks districts, water districts, and air quality districts are all examples of this approach. There are over 37,000 of these districts in the US. They're usually specialized, which can make them efficient at what they do, but this approach can also lead to lots of separate organizations that themselves don't work together. Then you start having cooperation problems, but in a different way but regional special districts can be incredibly powerful and influential. The Port Authority of New York and New Jersey is an example of this. It operates most of the bridges, tunnels, airports, and seaports in the New York metropolitan area. The second way a region can cooperate is through annexation. This is when one city absorbs another, resulting in an expanded city. This used to be a very common way for cities to grow, and many old neighborhoods used to be separate cities before annexation. As suburbs got larger though, local residents objected to annexation, preferring local control and generally not being associated with the central city. Despite opposition, some cities in the 20th and 21st centuries have annexed their neighbors, including Houston, Atlanta, Phoenix, and Oklahoma City. 
Jacksonville, Florida is the largest city by land area in the contiguous United States, and it got that way from a specific kind of annexation, a city-county merger. This is when the separate city and county governments become one entity and the city and county boundaries align. Annexations and mergers are sort of a backdoor way into regional governments, because it's all under the same local government, not a separate regional organization. But the benefit is that the local government can do zoning for the entire annexed area, something regional organizations just can't do. Our next method of regional cooperation are regional planning agencies, such as councils of government and metropolitan planning organizations. Councils of government, called COGS, serve as a place of communication, information sharing, and negotiation between member local governments. The board of directors of COGS are primarily made of elected officials from the member cities. Metropolitan planning organizations, or MPOs, are another type of regional agency, but one with a transportation focus. The federal government required metropolitan areas to form NPOs as a part of the Federal Aid Highway Act of 1962. The federal government at the time was doling out millions of dollars to build interstate highways, and the government preferred to work with a single regional entity instead of each individual city when building urban highways. At a minimum, MPOs must adopt a regional transportation plan with a 20-year plan horizon and a transportation improvement program, which is a shorter-term list of projects with well-defined budgets. The federal government then allocates money to MPOs to build the projects in the Transportation Improvement Program. In many regions, the COG and the MPO are the same organization, while in others they remain separate. And in some cases it's even more complicated. In the Bay Area, the COG is the Association of Bay Area Governments, and the MPO is the Metropolitan Transportation Commission. Though separate, they work together on the state-mandated regional planning efforts, and in 2017 their staffs merged. But there are still two boards of directors. They remain separate, but share staff. Okay, still with me so far? I know that we're a little in the weeds and that regional governance isn't a really sexy topic, but now we're going to talk about two regions that are really out in front when it comes to regional governance and planning. The first one is the Twin Cities metro area in Minnesota. It makes sense that Minneapolis and St. Paul will be the leaders in regional cooperation, as they are two large cities located directly across from each other, separated by the Mississippi River. It is in nobody's interest to have one city's sewage outflow upstream of another's drinking water intake, for example, so they had to work together. In 1957, the Minnesota State Legislature passed a bill creating what is now called the Metropolitan Council to foster cooperation between Minneapolis, St. Paul, and other cities in the region. The initial goal was to create a regional plan. When the 1962 Highway Act passed, the council became the MPO. In 1967, the region approved a region-wide property tax on new non-residential development, the first of its kind and still a unique feature. The Metropolitan Council continued to accrue responsibilities, and today it manages the region's transit, regional land use planning, wastewater treatment, and affordable housing. This makes it different from special districts which typically have one focus, and it's more than an MPO because its responsibilities go beyond transportation and planning. It's getting pretty close to a regional government, and maybe the only thing that's missing is elections. The council is appointed and serves at the pleasure of the governor. There's one and only one regional planning organization that directly elects its board, and that's Metro in Portland, Oregon. Six Metro council members are elected by district, and the Metro Council president is elected region-wide. And similar to the Metropolitan Council in Minnesota, Metro has a broad portfolio of responsibilities, including regional planning and operating the regional parks, the zoo, the convention center, and the expo center. It also has the authority to take over the operation of the regional transit service, which it hasn't done yet. If you were to combine the Metropolitan Council and Metro, you would have an organization that's probably worthy of the title regional government. You'd have direct elections, region-wide taxation, and a wide variety of services provided to its residents. The researcher in me would love to see a few regions go full regional government, just to see if they can provide services more efficiently and plan more rationally. I actually have some personal experience with this topic. I interned at Metro in Portland. It was fantastic to see elected officials who really understood planning at a high level. If you have experience with city councils, you'll know that this isn't always the case, and the staff working there really felt like they were on the cutting edge of regional governance. But until we see more metros getting to the Portland level and beyond, we're going to be stuck with a mismatch of special districts, councils of government, and MPOs. So this is the part of the video where I talk about the sponsor, and I'm really excited about this one because the sponsor is me. It's me and CGP Grey, Real Life Lore, Polymatter, Wendover Productions, Lindsay Ellis, Real Engineering, and lots of other thoughtful creators, and the amazing video streaming service Curiosity Stream. You may be a little bit confused, but let me break it down. A bunch of fantastic educational YouTubers, and me somehow, teamed up to create Nebula, our own streaming video service. This is a place where you can watch our videos ad-free and support a whole bunch of quality creators at once. 
the creators get to experiment with different kinds of videos that the YouTube algorithm may not like, and do some cool collaborations, like Working Titles, a series about intro sequences to popular movies and TV shows. Maybe the craziest thing of all is that Nebula and CuriosityStream have teamed up, so you can get a subscription to Nebula and CuriosityStream for the insanely low annual subscription price of $19.99 or $2.99 per month. For that price, you get CuriosityStream's vast library of high-quality documentary films by the likes of Stephen Hawking, David Attenborough, Jane Goodall, and more. And you're also supporting dozens of high-quality educational creators on Nebula. That's a crazy good deal. I want to thank everyone who's signed up so far. All of us are watching the subscriber numbers increase, and we're so grateful. If you want to be one of the thousands of people taking advantage of this great deal, this great deal for creators and viewers, go to CuriosityStream.com citybeautiful and sign up. Thank you again so much.